the road to Mandalay is lined with golden spires. Myanmar. Over the years, political upheaval has rocked this ancient land. It rocks it still, but one thing has remained constant. The faith of the ancestors, Buddhism. Here, it is still a living force. Here, the Buddha is still venerated for his love of all creatures. Absorbed in prayer, the people of Myanmar blend their personal life into the spiritual world. There are no riches unless they are placed in the service of Buddha. Believers donate golden statues and jewels, and of all the gifts in Myanmar, the most precious is a stone from deep within the earth. The ruby. After decades of isolation, Myanmar has emerged slowly into the modern world. Precariously balanced between past and present, it floats on the currents of a new day. To journey here is to step back in time to a world of mystery and beauty. A land as hard and as lovely as its symbol, the ruby. Nestled between India and China, Myanmar, as Burma is now called, has the largest ruby mines in the world. They are tucked far away in the hinterlands. To reach them, we travel first to Yangon, the capital. The harbor is the gateway to the outside world. But in the streets of Yangon, there beats the heart of the country. Pagodas, monks, believers, and above all, rubies. The ruby dealers meet in Sui Bon Ta Street. Deals are made over a cup of tea in one of the many little sidewalk tea shops. An illegal market, but one that is tolerated. Still, nobody likes to be watched when showing the little red jewels. Tea and rubies. Both have a long tradition here. 100 years ago, it was the Maharajas who sold their rare gems to the Europeans. Today, the military controls the state ruby mines, and the country too. With Captain Kin Ng Zhao, we are about to undertake an incredible journey deep into the heart of an area that has long been closed to foreigners. A military zone, still top security. We set off from Tungi and travel into the notorious Golden Triangle, perhaps the most infamous drug-growing region on Earth. Heading to Mong Shu on the mountain Loi Sok Tok, we will be the first foreign team to film in one of the largest and most dangerous ruby mining areas in the world. Mine Mong Shu, it was found out last four years ago. And uh, still the area is not very secure and then that's why you are the only, the first person to get there as a foreigner. The area around Mong Shu achieved notoriety as the territory of the warlord and drug kingpin Kun Sa, who battled the Burmese government and its forces for years. Assembling his own army, Kun Sa vowed to lead the Shan one of Myanmar's ethnic tribes, to independence and prosperity. In return, the Shan would plant his opium in their fields. Today, after years of civil war, 
the peasants are as poor as ever. As for Kun Sa, he dissolved his army and disappeared, a rich man. Nowadays, there is a fragile peace in this troubled spot. Over 30,000 soldiers are still stationed east of Tungi. For security reasons, they say, but security is hard to find in the Golden Triangle. We too are given an escort of 60 soldiers. The soldiers are changed at every stage of the journey. We are announced and handed on from village to village. There is much talk of bandits and thieves and other scoundrels lurking on this road. The worst enemy, however, is the road itself. When we set off from Tangi, a journey of 170 miles lay ahead of us. But the deeper we penetrate into the military area, the more frequent the breakdowns. The mine on the mountain seems close enough to touch. But once again, our jeep is stuck in the mud. This time, it looks bad. Captain Zhao seems worried. Will we have to turn back? Spend the night in the middle of nowhere? But more and more helpers turn up. For when we get stuck, the cars behind us also come to a halt. Our escort becomes a towing service, a well-armed one. The monsoon season, though nearly over, is still wearing away the muddy track. We slog ahead another half mile, and then, finally, come to a dead halt. The last half mile will have to be covered on foot. This is the end of the world. Or it was until the first Shan families discovered rubies. Uh, it was found by some, some native people, and, but they don't know it's a precious stone, and they sell it out to some Chinese merchant at very cheap rate. And then the, this new come and spread up, spread out, and then many people go there and it's become like a ruby uh, rush. We arrive just before dusk in Loi Sok Tok. It's taken us two full days to cover 170 miles. Long after nightfall, we hear the distant sounds of the pumps and generators, yet the mine is nowhere in sight. We are deep in the mountain jungle of Myanmar, deep in the heart of the country. Peace descends upon the valley. We almost forget the mine. But dawn comes up like thunder in Myanmar. The next morning, we are awakened by dynamite blasting. On Loi Sok Tok, the hunt for rubies never stops. Fifty thousand people live on this mountain, and for most of them, life is restricted to a few square yards, the area they work in the mine. They leave the open air behind and head into the depths, 190 feet down the narrow shafts. Making their way down slippery bamboo ladders, they disappear day after day into one of the passages of the labyrinth, sometimes forever. There is talk of accidents where up to 70 people were buried.
While the technology is not modern, work at this mine does follow a system. The rubies must be lured from the mountain, the gems separated from the rock, and so a great human machine has been assembled. The rubble released by the blasting is carried away piece by piece and dumped out onto the waste pile. Hundreds of times a day, the men carry the rocks down the muddy steps. In rain and heat, they march in single file to unload their stones. The dirt that might actually contain rubies is shoveled into sacks, tied up, and passed along a human conveyor belt of several hundred yards. Again and again, day in and day out, the same motions send the sacks down the line to the first sorting station. Here they will be examined for the first time. In large sorting pens, the stone is separated from the dirt. The hunt for the ruby is conducted in foot-high sludge under the unblinking eyes of the foreman. Washing down the dirt, the men cull the stones from the mud. In this process, water is precious. Every drop is cleaned and recycled. Not with machines, but with human labor. Life in the mines may seem harsh, but Myanmar is one of the 10 poorest countries on earth. And here at Loi Sok Tok, each worker actually earns double the national wage, 4,000 jets, about $40. For this, workers come from all across the country. The hunt for treasures moves mountains and homes until 1992, the bamboo huts of the Shan mountain tribes stood here. Now, there is an ever-expanding lake. How many tons of earth have been turned over in search of the ruby? No one has counted. But the work never stops, and the cycle is never broken. The sorted material goes into the sacks. The sacks are collected and passed on once again. is the lift which will take the pre-sorted stone to its final sorting in the tent at the entrance to the mine.
Down below, over 200 sorters are at work, looking for rough stones. They toss and turn their sieves of gravel and dump them out onto the tables nearby. Their job, in a sea of brown, to find anything that glitters red. No one speaks. They stare at the gravel before them, searching, sorting. The waste pile at their feet grows. For hours on end, they stand on sharp stones and splinters, motionless, always in the same position. They sort with one hand, the left hand folded behind the back. Temptation is great, so the sorters are changed every six months. Only the foremen remain, and they never take their eyes off the sorters' hands. They control the workers and their work, often discovering small ruby slivers swept almost carelessly onto the floor. Hard as it may be to imagine, precious gems worth millions of dollars see the light of day here every month. Of course, the workers dream of sharing in this wealth, but between their dreams and the reality, there is a large gulf. They live under the most extreme conditions. The free board and lodging they get from the mine owners mean, for most of them, little more than a tarpaulin, a camp bed, a hovel in the midst of dirt and noise. Only when the oil simmers in the wok does the atmosphere mellow. But there is an unwritten law in the camp. The military is prepared to turn a blind eye on the occasional smuggled ruby as long as the lion's share remains untouched. They know that a few smuggled rubies arouse dreams in the miners which keep them going in their hard labor. And it is this dream which breathes life and color into Loy Sok Talk, which attracts the ragtag crowd of ruby merchants and wheeler dealers who have settled at the entrance to the mine. When the workers leave the mine in the evening, the dealers are waiting for them. Meal stones are at issue here, small stones sold to supply a family's basic needs. This deal was not clinched. But not far away, another exchange meets with success. <laughs> For ordinary people in the ruby business, everyday life is measured in the stones they hold. Children rummage at the women's feet, searching the ground for tiny ruby splinters. Farther down the road are the shacks of the more successful dealers. Their transactions with rubies are legal as long as both trading partners pay the 10% tax demanded by the military. How many actually pay the tax? How many stones pass through here? No one can say. These deals are clinched in the back rooms. There, too, are the small grinding shops, where, in the dim light, the ruby receives its final touches. It is mostly the small rubies that are processed here, 
Tiny stones, so fine, only a practiced artisan could work with them. On the Ruby Mountain, business is booming. There are gemstones enough for everyone. However, most of the profit does not flow through the shacks and the back rooms of Loy Sok Tok. It comes here. The military has its own experts who sort the stones according to quality and size. On the table is the daily yield from six state mines. Mr. Ko Mo Win, a sorter, explains the collection process. Every sorted parcel is deposited in the safe until there are enough to be sent to Yangon. That's at least once a month, sometimes twice. We ask about the bundle he's holding right now. Okay, so-so, uh, not good, not bad. This enigmatic response might conceal almost anything, even wonderful four-carat rubies like these, worth $40,000 a piece. How are these precious rubies taken out of Loy Sok Tok? By helicopter? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. We always send the rubies to Yangon with an escort, accompanied by bodyguards, as it were. The stones are usually taken to Yangon in five or six army buses. This load here will be escorted by three or four cars. Ruby transport has a military operation. The valuable cargo is in heavily armed hands. But here, there are always risks. The road is treacherous, and our convoy hits trouble. Two soldiers are injured in the accident, and the ruby caravan grinds to a halt. The munitions are collected, the next camp informed of the incident by radio, and then the work begins. Anyone who sets off for the Ruby Mountain reckons with the worst. The route always seems to take its toll. After a journey of 20 hours, we reach Tungi again. This quiet little town is only 170 miles from the mines, but it is worlds apart. Here, civilization rules again. The ruby market in Tungi is the meeting place for the buyers who do not wish to dirty their hands in the mud of Mengshu. Most of them buy stones here in grand style and take them just across the border to Thailand. For a mere 500 miles away lies the center of the international ruby market, Bangkok. The International Jewelry Trade Center has a daily turnover which Myanmar could only dream about. The biggest jewelers in the Asian world have settled here in Bangkok. They present the rubies in glitter and splendor as the world knows them, under glass. These are rare and sparkling treasures, precious jewels, symbols of power, wealth, and eternal youth. Yet, 
it seems fitting that these gemstones are blood red, the red of life and suffering. It is a strange irony that these incredible riches were born in the mud of one of the poorest countries on earth. A country where, in the sludge of daily existence, faith glitters like a gem. Where beauty and adversity are both facts of life. Here, in the land of the ruby.